tonight on CBC Vancouver News. And most of the cases that we're seeing still are linked. Record high, 165 new cases of COVID-19 in BC also. Uh, I've not made a decision about an election. What is new in this plan? That Speculation is rampant that we are heading to the polls and... The first thing I hear, we saw very loudly. Boom, boom, boom. Deadly night. Three homicides in Vancouver. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. It is a big number, at least when it comes to daily COVID-19 case numbers in BC. Today, a record high, 165 new cases are being reported in our province. Our Tina Lovegreen is here now to break down the latest figures. Tina. Yes, Leanne, another record-breaking number. As you said, 165 new cases of COVID-19 in our province. That's up from yesterday's total of 122 cases. Another person has died, meaning we have now lost 220 people here in BC. 57 people in hospital and 22 are in intensive care. Now, this number is slightly down from yesterday's total. Now, the province also confirmed two new outbreaks at Delta Hospital and Peace Arch Hospital, but no new community outbreaks to report. Though we do continue to see exposure events, and with today's record high case numbers, health officials once again reminding people to keep their bubbles small, to stick to the same six people, not to hang out with a new group of friends every other night. Yeah, she was very firm on that today. And Tina, last night you had a story on frustrated parents who are trying to get their kids tested for COVID-19 as they head back to school, only to find those long lineups. Today, though, word of a new method of sample collection for school-aged children that should make the process a bit easier. Yes, and it's a first of its kind in the world and made by a BC company. A new mouth rinse gargle test now available for school aged children, replacing the nasal swab, which can be super uncomfortable. Here's a quick look at a video prepared by the BC CDC that shows the process. So the idea is kids put salt water in their mouths and alternate between swishing and gargling for 20 seconds, then spit it into a tube and off it goes to the lab for testing. This, of course, a much easier way to collect samples, especially for children, and that's particularly important as we head back to school. It's a combination of, of wanting to test more children, knowing that more te children are going to need to be tested now that we're back in the school setting and making it easier. Ideally, and this is our, our plan as we're ramping up our testing, is making uh, this type of a saliva test um, or a gargle test. Um, it's just a different way of collecting it that makes it easier without having uh, needing a healthcare worker. We want to have it available for everybody. Right now, the focus is on children for the, for the reasons of, of supply. Now the mouth rinse test does need to take place at a testing site but it can be done without a healthcare worker as as you heard Dr. Bonner Henry say there which will save time. There are also some other requirements before getting the test like children should not eat or drink an hour before so I highly suggest parents head to the BCCDC website to find out what those requirements are before heading out. And as for the accuracy of the test Dr. Henry says it's just as accurate as the nasal swab and again the goal is to eventually make it available for everyone but for now, they're reserving it for children due to a shortage in supply. Mike, Leanne. All right, good to know. Thanks, Tina. Tina Lovegreen reporting for us tonight. Meanwhile, some restaurant and bar owners are pushing back against Dr. Henry's order to stop serving liquor by 10 p.m. They say last week's order is too vague and continues to jeopardize a fragile industry. I don't think Dr. Henry understood the financial impact of that. Um, she's obviously looking at the health outcomes. We're all on the same page about that. Uh, but, but if we could extend that for a couple of extra hours, it really would make the difference from guaranteed insolvency and people having a chance to make a go of it. Several hospitality industry associations have written a formal letter to the government asking for more clarity and an extension of business hours to midnight. They say after eight days they haven't heard back. But today, Dr. Henry confirmed receipt of the letter and says the public health order was necessary. We put in the restrictions when it became clear that there was challenges meeting the safety requirements. And so we tried to be as specific as possible and uh, as supportive as possible as we can. 
Henry says WorkSafe BC heard from several employees who felt they were at risk because some establishments were breaking public health orders. She says the measures are reasonable. Premier John Horgan and Finance Minister Carol James unveiled their $1.5 billion plan aimed at stimulating BC's ravaged finances today. But the timing has many speculating it looks more like the start of a new mandate for the NDP as rumors of a snap election continue to swirl. They certainly do. Justin McElroy is on the story for us tonight. So Justin, is this uh, all about electioneering? I mean, it depends who you talk to, but certainly when you have the Premier and Finance Minister come together and outline a whole bunch of stuff, a lot of which is an old spending announcements in a shiny document called BC's Economic Recovery, people might think so. But if you break down the money that was announced today, it looks like this. You talked about the billion and a half dollars for clear economic spending. That's in a variety of different sectors and about 20 or 25 different initiatives, including in tourism, including in infrastructure, much more. There's also money that they outlined there for healthcare, for municipalities, for transportation. They also announced today two new tax credits for businesses. One of them is a rebate on PSD if you're investing in heavy machinery. The other is for any company that increases its payroll in the next three months. So there's a lot there, a lot that's going to help different people but of course at this time of the year uh, people's eyebrows might be raised about the timing. I've not made a decision about an election I've been working on as I said the, the difficult decisions of uh, the trade-offs that are, are involved in making sure that we uh, expend public resources in a way that's responsible for the taxpayer. So, Justin, as we heard him say there, he hasn't made up his mind yet. What do we think is going to come next? Well, tomorrow there's going to be more announcements from the NDP about possible candidates. A big one today was Nathan Cullen, the former MP. He's going to run for the nomination in Stikine. We're also going to see more spending announcements tomorrow from the government as well, more press conferences. And tonight the provincial council for the party will be meeting as well, talking about all this. So there's no guarantee yet there's going to be an election, but certainly the party doing everything you would expect them to do if they were planning on it. All right. We shall watch closely. Justin McElroy reporting tonight. Thanks. Well, two days after that massive fire destroyed part of New Westminster's main tourist attraction, a man has been arrested. It comes as crews had to take down part of that iconic waterfront artwork. Dan Burt joins us with more. So, Dan, first of all, who is the suspect? We don't know much about him yet, Leanne, but New Westminster police say they arrested a man on Tuesday for what it calls arson-related offenses. And they are linked to this, the huge fire that wiped out part of the Royal City's historic pier on Sunday night. Police say the man has been released on conditions and has not been charged. They're still gathering evidence and expect to send information to the Crown for it to consider charges. Remember, this blaze broke out on the timber wharf section of Pier Park, destroying one of the oldest parts of that pier. The smoke from that fire was so bad, schools, the courthouse, and some businesses had to close in New West. And combined with wildfire smoke at one point, New Westminster's air quality was worse than New Delhi, India. The fire is now contained, but it is still smoldering, and the fire chief says those creosote-soaked logs could burn for weeks. And Dan, so all of this news comes as part of that iconic W at the pier sadly had to be taken down. Yes, this is very sad to see. Take a look. The big W built out of shipping containers, part of the WOW Westminster Arts installation, was torn down yesterday. It was badly damaged in that fire. The city says crews tried to save it, but the timber wharf around it was just too unstable, not enough support. The WOW Westminster was installed in 2015, part of the riverfront urban beach where people could play volleyball, they could swing in hammocks, stroll on that long boardwalk. New Westminster's mayor says they have lost an iconic part of their city and their waterfront. Leanne, Mike. Very sad for certain. Dan Burrett reporting tonight. Thanks. Our police are still trying to piece together what happened last night after three separate homicides in Vancouver. As Mickey Cowan reports, neighbors are worried despite police reassurance that the public isn't at risk. Three homicides all within hours of each other in Vancouver at two different scenes. My building's not as safe as it used to be, maybe. Two people were found unresponsive in a room at the Astoria, single room occupancy hotel Wednesday night. 
This resident woke up from a nap to find an unsettling sight. I woke up around like 7.30 again, and that's when there were like police on, the, on, the, on my floors asking everybody questions, knocking on every door. Joel Branscombe says he didn't hear anything, although says he tends to block out sound as the building can be pretty loud with music and arguments. One victim died at the scene and the other at hospital. The second incident happened here at East 64th Avenue and Knight Street. There's still plenty of officers on the scene today, even a day later. We're told somebody was shot outside a home. Hung Vuong lives nearby. He came home a bit after dinner time and heard loud bangs. That a gun shot. Bum, bum, bum. Blowy. At first, he thought it was fireworks, but it was far more than that. Multiple 911 calls came in about shots fired around 7.30. Police aren't saying yet how the victims died or who they were, except this. Were any of the victims known to police? I believe they did have a history with police, yes. There are plenty of other unanswered questions, like whether there is a connection with a burned out car found shortly after enrichment, or if gang activity is involved. Overall, a violent evening. And of course, it's, it's very concerning for us. So yeah, our, our investigators were working around the clock last night. No one's been arrested yet, but officers say the public isn't at risk. Perhaps some reassurance for people calling these neighborhoods home. Mickey Cowan, CBC News, Vancouver. The man accused of killing an Abbotsford teenager plans to argue he's not responsible due to mental illness. Gabriel Klein was found guilty of second-degree murder in the death of Letitia Reimer. Klein fatally, Klein rather, fatally stabbed the student four years ago while she was in school. Now, his lawyer will argue Klein is not criminally responsible because of a mental disorder. The announcement comes just a week before he was to be sentenced. Crown is arguing Klein faked symptoms of a mental disorder after his arrest. The court heard that Klein told a psychiatrist who assessed him at a hospital that his lawyer would use that as a defense. Murder charges against the man accused in a fatal shooting outside a Langley Hotel have been dropped in exchange for a lesser charge. David Brian Tell was charged with first-degree murder for the 2017 death of Tyler Pastek. Tell pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit murder earlier this month. Pastek was shot dead near Willowbrook Mall June 9th. Today, Crown prosecutors say Tell will be sentenced on the conspiracy charge. His hearing is set for November. Any outstanding charges, including that first-degree murder charge, will be stayed. Our first look at the forecast now with meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff. Uh, well, our old friend Smoke was uh, back with us uh, again today. Any hope for a clear out? Where the beginning of the end has started, Mike uh, and Leanne, I am on window opening watch Thank for you. you and everyone else <laughs> as we head into, uh, yeah, a hopeful Friday. We do have to get through probably poor air quality tonight and tomorrow. I want to show you pictures out of Victoria earlier today uh, where smoke was at once again unhealthy levels as it was here in Vancouver and most of the interior. Uh, look for poor air quality tonight and tomorrow morning. Take a look at where Environment Canada has a special weather statement in place, actually extending it northward and westward. So a huge swath of the province uh, expected to see poor air quality tomorrow morning before we get the rain. I will time out the arrival of that rain. It's probably more like this time tomorrow, but I'm expecting much improved air quality for the weekend. So I'll time it all out coming up. Sounds good. Thanks, Joe. Next stop, this station. The province has named the new Broadway subway stations. The big reveal after the break. And thanks for staying with us during our commercial-free live stream. Lots of Canadians have been using downtime created by COVID-19 to take on new projects and develop, develop our skills. Yeah, and a Nova Scotia folk artist is using the lull to develop a whimsical new installation in his front yard. The CBC's Colleen Jones took a short drive up the coast from Halifax to take in the Whirligig Pasture. If you've traveled along Highway Number 7 on the Eastern Shore, you've likely seen Barry Colpitt's house. 
old, old ones here. That angel's pretty old. Jesus himself might be the most obvious carving, but let's not forget his other friends. Patricia? Yeah. Patricia Ryan. And my grade three teacher there. Really? Then there's this, his head museum. That, uh, that one there is Anne. I head with Barry to his workshop where the magic happens. Oh, yeah. Workshop here, one of them. The Wind Powered Skinny Lady Beauty Contest. Got my flying bird chair. It's your what? My flying bird chair. See, when you sit in that, it's like you're flying with a flock of birds. No power tools? Ah, uh, no. Rather, his go-to tool yeah, is this here. horse knife. He's chipping away at the wood to form a wind catcher. It'll look like, uh, like that one there. Friend of mine, Anne, holding up uh, her baby. Now, making whirly gigs is something he always like wanted to do, but it took the lockdown and pandemic to nudge him in this direction. And it turns uh, the baby's halo and these two flowers behind it. I've just made the odd one, but uh, I thought, well, this year I'm going to get some made, this winter. And then the, the disease popped up, and then I had all kinds of time. He started building these at the start of the pandemic. He now has made 22 for his whirly gig pasture. Do you have a favorite? Probably this one. Uh, lady's hat, eh? It's got a cat on it. And <laughs> bird on, on the cat's back. And... If you think his art is limited to the exterior, come on into his living room where his carvings and painted trim and pipes have a Maude Lewis vibe, although he doesn't see it. Maude Lewis here. He became a folk artist to find calm while working as a corrections officer at a jail. This took his mind off that. He left that work in 1996, and 27 years later, he's carved out a living with his art. Although COVID has shut down the usual craft and folk art shows, he's found his whirligig pasture, while it doesn't bring him money, does bring a smile to anyone who stops by. Colleen Jones, CBC News, Tangier. Carved out a career? I like that, Colleen. Like Very that. nice. That was good. I think it's fair to say there's a lot of... Um, well, interesting stuff there. Yeah. Yes, yeah. the 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 head museum, just a bunch of heads. That was a little odd. No, yeah, really. Next time I'm in uh, the Halifax area, we'll have to maybe head up the road and go visit the Whirly Gig Pasture. Yeah, maybe your Back head could become a model. There you go. Be in the head museum. That'd be fantastic. But the the Whirly parts were cool. <laughs> Back in just a sec with more news. The world is not back to normal. Life has not fully resumed. We are not at the finish line yet. We know we can do it. As phase three of the economic New restart. COVID restrictions will mean that element. In times like these, get trusted news from a trusted source, your public broadcaster. Anytime, anywhere, anyway. CBC and Cuba. With construction set to begin in just a few weeks, six station names have been revealed tonight for the new Millennium Line Broadway extension. Heading west, the line begins at Great Northern Way, Emily Carr. Next, Mount Pleasant, followed by Broadway City Hall. Then on to Oak VGH, South Granville. And finally, the line ends at Arbutus. The Broadway subway means less congestion, better transit, more rental housing, thousands of high-paying construction jobs and will be an important weapon in our fight against climate change. The $2.8 billion line will extend 5.7 kilometers underground. It is anticipated an end-to-end -end trip will take about 11 minutes. The head of the Vancouver Aquarium says they are fighting bankruptcy but vows they will reopen their doors again someday. CEO Lass Gustafson says they need to find a way to function that's both profitable and safe amid COVID-19. The aquarium needs about a million dollars a month to cover its costs. But with no money coming in from ticket sales, the aquarium is dependent on public donations, government funding, and dipping into its savings. Normally, it attracts more than a million vi visitors a year. They have already laid off 209 employees, leaving it with 75 staff to take care of nearly 70,000 animals. More than 200 B.C. firefighters are heading south to help battle Oregon's wildfires. They're being deployed to Redmond, southeast of Portland, 
More than 800 personnel volunteered to head south to lend a hand. The fires in Oregon have killed at least eight people and destroyed more than a thousand homes. The BC government says the decision to send its personnel came after the U.S. asked for help. As for our neck of the woods, enough firefighters and resources are still in BC just in case any fires start locally. And Joe joins us again now. So Joe, those firefighters much needed. How are things looking in Oregon right now? Leanne, we are finally getting some good news in the forecast for the Pacific Northwest. So for all of the fires really burning across Oregon and Washington, and it's the same weather system we're waiting to clear things out here in British Columbia. Let me show you, though, the watches and warnings south of the border, because as is the case, anytime we get extreme weather, it's a double-edged sword. So the wet weather that is coming has actually prompted flash flood warnings in the areas that were just burnt with those fires in western Oregon. And you can see the lightning strikes I've just added on. On. Things are starting to bubble up tonight. So where we have uh, loose soil and debris, uh, risk of flash flooding as we get those convective cells tonight into tomorrow. Uh, but that is the leading edge of a change in a weather pattern. Uh, things have been sliding up from the southwest. We're going to get more of a westerly flow. And that's what all of us across the Pacific Northwest really need to clear out the smoke and also uh, douse those fires south of the border. This is not going to help things in California, though. Uh, they still have a couple months left in their season. Temperatures right now uh, cool, 18 and through YVR, uh, losing about three, three minutes and change of daylight uh, every day. Watch as I take you through the uh, precip forecast. This is what we're all talking about. So uh, I've been looking at the timing from a, a a number of different models. I think 4 to 5 p.m. is probably our best bet at seeing those first raindrops tomorrow, so smoky start. But steady showers through the day on Saturday. We'll catch a few breaks on Sunday and Monday, and then Tuesday is when we're expecting that bigger rainmaker to come in, that uh, Pineapple Express that we're all well, actually hoping for at this point. Warm temperatures in the interior, uh, getting up to the high 20s uh, for the next couple of days. There is our fall outlook, uh, seasonal and cool for the weekend. And yes, that does mean open windows will be welcome. Actually, once we get that air quality to drop, it's uh, recommended to open the windows to let the poor air quality inside out. Well, that sounds like a great idea. All right, Joe, thanks very much. It is a magical world of fairies created in the woods of Saanich, but it turns out not everyone's a fan why this fairy paradise's days might be numbered next. Clearbrook Village looks like a normal townhouse development. 305 units clustered on 25 acres, 50 minutes from downtown Vancouver. You get wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, a wood-burning fireplace, drapes, fridge and stove, washer and dryer, and three bedrooms, next to your neighbor's three bedrooms. And of course, it's close to schools and shopping. What makes Clearbrook Village different are the prices. These units start at $67,900, and top price is 76300 The one-year mortgage rate is 14%. And there's more. If you buy one of these townhouses before next April, you get a crack at $1 million in prizes. That $1 million is coming out of the developer's pocket. It's the profit he had hoped his company would make on this $18 million investment. The market started turning around three months ago and we were too far in the project to turn around. And um, I guess over the last three months, it slowly dawned on us that this is one job that we're just not going to make any money on and I guess the decision, uh, the final decision has been made in the last seven days. First one. The pitch seems to have worked. Two townhouses were sold within an hour of the sale start Saturday. Why did you decide to buy one of these houses? The price. <laughs> We've looked around a lot and uh, we, don't, we haven't started a family yet so we're thinking it's just right for us at the time because with that kind of payment, you can't beat it anywhere, as far as we, what we've looked around for anyways. What about after one year when the 14% mortgage runs out? Well, then uh, we'll have to we worry about it. <laughs> scrimp and save. More than 500 couples browse Saturday, lured by the price and the prizes. Have you been looking around for places very much? Oh, not really. We're just kind of interested in the prices and the, the prizes and everything they're offering here and seeing what the, the units look like themselves. And developer Ken Browse? He just hopes it will all go away soon. 
Do you wish you hadn't started now? Yes, sir. Certainly do. We would never start a project this size. When we started this project, we could have sold these units for $89,000 and up. And that was our intention, and that was our price list. You know, we intended to make a lot of money on this project. Times have changed. Doug Rushton, CBC News, Clearbrook. Hi, I'm Amy Bell. Here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Stream your favorite CBC dramas or comedies 24-7 on demand on the CBC Gem app. Plus, you can live stream CBC Vancouver News. Check it out at gem.cbc.ca. And never miss a special programming series or contest. Subscribe to CBC Vancouver's e-newsletter at cbc.ca slash Vancouver Inbox and keep connected with us. We are continuing to profile transgender activists who help pave the way for trans rights in Canada. The third person we're learning about this week is Rupert Raj, who is credited with founding some of the first trans organizations and publications. Here's a look at how he's made a difference in the community. Rupert Raj was one of the earliest uh, trans activists in Canada. He had a Polish father and a South Asian mother and identifies as a, a Eurasian person of color. He's from Toronto. He transitioned in 1971 and he started the first Canadian uh, organization on behalf of trans people in 1978. It was called the Foundation for the Advancement of Canadian Transsexuals. In the 1970s there were absolutely no protections uh, for trans people of any sort in, in the law. It was extremely risky to go public as a trans person at that time. As far as I've been able to determine, this is the first publication that was specifically for trans men anywhere in the world. The Metamorphosis and other similar publications as they started to come, come about uh, were available to people by subscription. You took a lot of risk if people knew that you were trans. And so a lot of people in uh, earlier decades uh, would be asking to have material like this mailed to them in a plain brown envelope with no return address on it. Some people went so far as to take out uh, post office boxes under aliases, under other names or just with no name attached to it at all, so that they could pick up their mail in a place where nobody that they knew would see what they were receiving in the mail. Well, a trail in North Saanich that underwent a ferry makeover might need some magic to keep its wings. Mm -hmm. This ferry land was created by neighbor Lorraine McKay and her grandkids when COVID-19 first struck. And for months, these kids have been coming here nearly every day, creating and adding decorations to a nearly 300 meter stretch. And the further you walk, the more you see. Display upon display of a fairy world. It even has its own general store, hotel, and a city council. But this little pixie palace might be coming to an end after the city received a complaint calling the decorations littering. Unleash your imagination. I mean, then they go to a whole world that they can control and you can see where their imaginations took them. According to McKay, even the city staff member who delivered the news was surprised. It's a disappointing blow for those who have spent months creating it. Yeah, it's not known who made the complaint, but McKay has moved many of the items back across her property line with next door neighbors doing the same. They're trying to save some of the fairy tale trail and hoping this little piece of magic can stay. You know, it's, it's kind of disappointing. It is. It's well, so cute. All these trails around uh, the south coast have been, uh, you know, collection areas for little trinkets and ornaments and things. Kids have been leaving them uh, out there during the pandemic. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I know. It's too bad. I know. Well, there, I live in Mount Pleasant and just along West 14th. I believe there's a couple families that have done that, have put yeah. little pixie trails out. So it's very cute. Hopefully they get Stop to keep complaining. theirs. Stop complaining. Stop <laughs> complaining. 
All right, before we go today, a reminder, you can watch this newscast live online every day at 6 p.m. Yeah, find us on CBC Gem, the free app, also on Facebook and YouTube. And if you want to watch us on TV during the NHL Conference Finals, we'll be on after the game. And Dan Burt always has your late local news on CBC Television at 11 o'clock right after the National. And tonight, a couple more hazy sky images that we're seeing due to the wildfire smoke. Hopefully that clears very soon. Have a good night. Good night.